You can put it on the board. Yes. Welcome to the Sports Circus. I'm your ringmaster, Sal, live from Las Vegas in the Amp TV studio, AAMP.TV. Today's show is brought to you by UppercutChops.com. Check out their tasty selection of all-natural, dry-aged, USDA Prime, Angus, and Wagyu steaks and chops. Wait till you try their best-in-class New York steaks, the filet mignon, of course, the king of all, those massive cowboy cut and tomahawk cut ribeye steaks. Best in the business. Hell, even those... Wagyu and Angus Prime Burgers will likely be the best you ever had. Certainly the best I've ever had. Check them out at UppercutChops.com. That's UppercutChops.com on your mobile device or on your regular computer. Also, give them a call. Maybe you don't want to check it out electronically. Maybe you want to talk to somebody. Call 702-799-9935. 702-799-9935. And find out what's for dinner at UppercutChops.com. Round of applause. <laughs> it's the Kung Fu applause. Hey, listen, folks, we're live. Sometimes you press the wrong button. Sometimes you don't, if you know what I mean. <laughs> All right. Now that we've got that out of the way, make sure you want to welcome, welcome in everybody on our CBS, NBC, and Fox Sports affiliates from coast to coast, all of our independents, and of course, everybody watching on TV, Cox, Comcast, Spectrum, Frontier, Wow Cable, Television Affiliates, Time Warner Cable as well in certain markets. Thanks for joining us, as well as in hotels in over a half a million rooms from coast to coast. Yes, that's every Nielsen-rated market in America. All right. And of course, if you were watching, you would have watched something very special happen in the World Series for the second time in history. A no-hitter was thrown in the World Series. Yes! How exciting is that? Last time it happened, 1956. All right, Yankee fans, go ahead. Take credit for it because I know you're going to. That's what Yankee fans do. Of course, we're on the Yankees radio network over in Honolulu, so we can't complain too much. But nonetheless, it's been 62 years, 66 years, excuse me. 1966 was the last time a no-hitter was thrown. In fact, that was a perfect game. That was Don Larson's perfect game against hated crosstown rival, the Brooklyn Dodgers. How do you like them apples? And this time, it was the Astros tossing a combined no hitter in game four of the World Series against the Phillies. And let's face it, the Phillies just beat the living daylights out of the Astros in the game before, shutting them down by a touchdown, 7 0, only to get turned around and beat 5 0 in your own park and being no hit. Yes, it's the second time for the Phillies this season being no hit. The New York Mets did it, in fact, earlier in the season. So, as the Headlines read across the nation, across every medium that's reporting on this. The Houston Astros, led by starter Christian Javier. Christian Javier, I had him on my fantasy baseball team all year, and I knew how good this kid was. Anyway, tossed the second no-hitter in World Series history. Javier and three relief pitchers combined to blank the Phillies in Game 4, 5 donut, and pulled even with the or with the Philadelphia Phillies in the World Series. So, so now you've got Houston and Philadelphia tied at two. And now the World Series has been reduced to a best of three series. Gotta like that. So the combined no-hitter joins Don Larson, as we mentioned. His perfect game in 1956, New York Yankees in the World Series against the Brooklyn Dodgers. And it's the third postseason no-hitter and comes at the same ballpark as the second. Roy Halladay's National League Division Series no-hitter for the Phillies a dozen years ago. How do you like that? Now, Javier, this kid's 25. Man, this guy's got ice in his veins. They call him the reptile. And, of course, his reptilian his reptilian pitching was really something. Man, this guy just deals. And he doesn't give a damn what happens around him. This guy knows how to pitch. He's a professional pitcher. Javier's 25. Fired six no-hit innings to help Houston shut up the obnoxious Philadelphia crowd and rebound from a rough game three, as we mentioned, losing by a touchdown, striking out nine, walking two. After 97 pitches, Dusty Baker yanks him from the game and turned to the bullpen, who was well-rested. I can't really complain much about it, although as a pitcher, if I got a no-no going, I want to go front to back. Every pitcher 
when you start a game and you got a no hitter going, you don't want to get pulled in that game. Oh, hell no. You want the chance to have the no hitter yours. In recent years, they've been doing a lot of this combined no hitter crap. Look, I get it. It's about winning the game. But what about a little bit of excitement for the pitcher? What about that? Yes, oh, I know there's no I in team and all that other nonsense, whatever. We've got to keep this a G-rated show, folks, so we'll make sure we say that kind of stuff. If you know what I mean. <laughs> anyway, so Dusty pulls him from the game. And, of course, Brian Abreu, Rafael Montero, and Ryan Presley each pitched one inning to close it out. And they all did very well. I mean, you got to walk out of Presley, whatever. Doesn't matter. That's when the chips were down in the ninth inning. Overall, the Astros struck out 14 Phillies, retired 18 in a row between walks. And that was between the third and ninth innings. Now, 18 in a row, man, that's six innings of just shut down, get out of the batter's box. Good morning, good afternoon, and good night. That's what that is. Nonetheless, Javier is finishing only his first full season as a big leaguer. Imagine that. Starter, as a starter, by getting logged into the history books, into the record books, as the author of the longest hitless World Series start outside of Don Larson's Perfecto. How do you like that? Nice little round of applause for Christian Javier. And, of course, he passed Atlanta Braves pitcher Ian Anderson, who went five innings without allowing a hit in the 2021 World Series Game 3 against who? The Houston Astros. And the Braves' bullpen eventually allowed the first hit, leading off of the eighth, and blew that one. Doesn't matter. But this one, no fluke, folks. No. Javier tossed seven spotless innings to start a combined no-no against the Yankees earlier this season as well and allowed the lowest batting average in baseball in the second half of the season among all starting pitchers. This guy can pitch. Now, the Phillies were also victims of a combined no-hitter earlier this year, going hitless against the New York Mets, as I had mentioned earlier, and that was just about to start the season off back in April. Now, coming off a major breakout that, I don't know, that established him as a bona fide starter, Javier's nickname, as I said, is El Reptil, the reptile, because earlier in his career deemed cold-blooded, a descriptor that now seems appropriate, he cooled the Phillies' bats, who shelled Lance McCullers, who's a very good pitcher, by the way, in Game 3, mostly with what? With dead red, fastballs. He whips it in high in the zone, creating the feeling that it's rising. And then he plays off it with a biting slider and an occasional curve. So this guy's got batters, eyes looking up, looking down, looking up, follow the ball, follow the ball. Here we go. It's going up, it's going down, right? And so the thing is, when you get the batter doing this here, everybody on TV can see me doing this up and down. As the ball goes up and down, look, my eyes are following it up and down. The problem is this. The batter doesn't have a chance to do what? Focus on one particular zone to hit. And it leaves the hitters doing what? Guessing. It leaves them guessing. It leaves them in between, meaning we don't know the speed, the velocity of the pitch. Not only that, we don't even know the height, if he's consistent, if he's letter high, if he's knee high, if he's in the dirt. We don't even know what the hell to expect. And this is exactly what Javier is doing with that ball. And I got to tell you, it's a disaster as a hitter. I was never a really good hitter, and I know that for a fact. I was a 267 lifetime hitter. Which, <laughs> well, it's, it's not too terribly bad, but I hit one home run in my entire career. Only one, and that's a whole other story for another time. Nonetheless, but this guy is whipping the ball in. I don't know. He's, he's throwing it in the 90s, whatever. He's, he's getting close to 100 miles an hour. But, of course, out of his 97 pitches, 70 were fastballs. And the hardest thing to do in sports, folks, is to hit a baseball, yet to hit a fastball. Yes. And this guy threw 70% of his pitches were fastballs. Like, hey, listen, folks, we're going to throw a fastball. Let's see if you can hit it. You just can't. And let's face it, if you can get a hit three times out of every 10 at bats in baseball, you're in the Hall of Fame. That's how hard it is to hit a fastball. Nonetheless, all of Houston's runs in that same game, of course, came in the fifth inning. They chased Aaron Nola of the Phillies by roping three straight hits. And of course, when Phillies relief star Jose Alvarado came in, he plunked Jordan Alvarez to drive in the first run. And let's face it, who wants to pitch that guy? 
That guy's a home run hitting machine, and he is no small human either. This guy is a big bopper, and he can hit him a country mile. So guess what? They plunk him, and then who comes to the plate? Mr. RBI himself, Alex Bregman, who's leading the world in RBIs. And what does he do? He follows with a two RBI double. Why? Because that's what he does. That's the story, folks. And a no-no by the Astros at Philadelphia for game four, tying the series at two. How exciting for the fans of baseball around the world. doesn't matter whether you like this team or like that team. Hey, listen, folks. A no-hitter is a no-hitter until it's in the postseason. Now there's a lot of pressure. I mean, look, there's pressure on a day-to-day basis, but that is the postseason. That's crazy. So when you could do it, I don't care whether you did it by yourself or if it was a combined no-hitter. Listen, folks, that is the pinnacle of baseball. In fact, they should give a ring for that. What do you think about that? (laughs) All right, back here in a few minutes on the circus. Lots more to come, folks. Don't go anywhere. Listen to these messages. Okay, we got something for you. Welcome back to the Sports Circus. I'm Roy Firestow. Now it's time to throw it back to Sal. A two-out rally is predicated on what those hitters are doing at the plate. When you look at what the hitters were doing, they were shortening up the stroke, they were getting up on the bat, they are rotating the knuckles, they were doing all the right things to get around on everything and protect the plate. How far could you throw a flag? What's your record for throwing a flag? <laughs> I know there's bean bags or something. There's bean bags, marks and spots. Flag, you've got a little uh, sand in it, too, and you roll it up to a little ball to try What's to get to the record? spot. People think that you're throwing it a huge distance. You don't have to throw it a huge distance. You just got to get it on the right line. But do but, they have like a punt uh, passing kick nah, for flags? No, no. <laughs> no but you can throw it for 50. <laughs> So I had this weight in, the, in my flag, and it was in the back, and, when, and I was on the wing, and I went to throw it, and it got caught in the, in the back of my pants, and, and I swung it. it. Swung it like this, and it, and it went across, it hit the kid in the helmet. The kid, <laughs> kid looked at me and said, now, don't go off sides again. The <laughs> <laughs> goofiest thing that we ever did was they filled a swimming pool full of jello, <laughs> and people could pay to watch Gary and I dive into this pool of jello. And he and I raised a hundred thousand dollars doing that. <laughs> That's hilarious. And you know, at least when you go underwater, you can actually eat jello. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> He's not a dumb guy, but he doesn't he, follow instructions. He made a terrible play. Even if he got tackled and didn't fumble, it's a bad play. The fact is he didn't follow instructions. And you say he's not a dumb guy. Therefore, his own agenda he put ahead of his team. I agree. Thus, he is a dumb guy. Well, yeah, and Ohio cross- State has a $100 million yeah. recruiting budget that I'd love to see where they're spending their $100 million. Central Florida's earned their way. Give them a shot. In fact, if they extend the playoffs to eight teams, so you get the Power Five, they all get their automatic bid, and then you get three at large. That would solve all the unbeaten teams and maybe an extra team from Pick Your Favorite Power Five team. There's no primetime show like it on air that'll punch you in the mouth, (laughs) and you'll beg for more. (laughs) It's a circus, and we prove it every day. WAYB FM 95 Atlantic City. EXW Trenton kicks 101 and a half. The music you love to hear.
Welcome back to the Sports Circus. I'm your ringmaster, Sal, live from Las Vegas in the AMP TV studio, AAMP.TV. This segment brought to you in part by our friends over at Legal Shield, providing legal protection and peace of mind. Legal Shield can help with traffic tickets, texting and driving, DUIs, court appearances, estate planning, maybe someone socked you in the head. You need a lawyer, contact Legal Shield, maybe they can help. 213 245 1305. That's 213 245 1305. Email them for more information at info at nocourt.us. That's info at nocourt.us. Also, check them out. Read about them at www.nocourt.us. Again, www.nocourt.us. Yes! They've been with us since the beginning. So we continue to give them lots of love. All right, welcome back to everybody watching on television on Hotel TV in over a half a million rooms from coast to coast. Also, Cox Comcast Spectrum, Frontier, and Wild Cable Television affiliates, plus CBS, NBC, and Fox Sports affiliates, plus independents from coast to coast, including our friends over in Honolulu, CBS Sports 1500, KHKA, home of the 49ers, best team in the NFC West, by the way. The New York Yankees, of course, sitting home watching the World Series, and the Alabama Crimson Tide also... Welcome in to everybody that may be listening in on NBC News and CNBC over in California with our friends over there, as well as right here in Las Vegas. KQQY, yes, big news coming for Las Vegas Public Radio. Stay tuned on that one, folks. Welcome in to everybody over in Atlanta, WDJY. Good morning to everybody over there, as well as everybody in Auburn, Alabama. Good evening to you over at WAUD. We got something for you in just a moment. And of course... Our friends over in Lubbock, Texas, that are picking up our content. And that's KTXT, Raider Radio, 88.1 FM, on the t- campus of Texas Tech University, plus all of our other affiliates from coast to coast as well. Thanks for joining us. By the way, so we talked about the no-hitter in the first segment from Christian Javier and the Gang of Three out of the bullpen. Also, how about this? How about some Major League Baseball home run records in the postseason, right? So we talk about the World Series. How about some of this stuff? A little World Series history. Which players had the most runs? This is according to NBC Sports, by the way. The most home runs in a single Major League Baseball postseason. Well, Randy Arozarena made history a couple of years ago following the pandemic shortened regular season. Now, the Rays outfielder went off with 10 homers. Two more than the previous record for a single postseason. And, of course, he benefited from the additional best-of-three wildcard series prior to the American League Division Series. And his team played 20 games before falling, of course, to the Dodgers in the World Series. Now, behind a Rosarena, four players have hit eight homers in one postseason, and five players have hit seven. Of course, a Rosarena with 10. Tied for second, Barry Bonds. How about a... How about some juice, Barry? What do you think about that? Are you thirsty? If you know what I mean. <laughs> Whatever. Carlos Beltran also hit eight in 2004. Nelson Cruz said the ageless wonder hit eight in 2011. Corey Seager also hit eight in 2020. And of course, Troy Gloss hit seven in 2002 in the Angels' only World Series appearance. Somehow they found a way to beat Dusty Baker, seemingly like everybody else does, if you know what I mean. <laughs> You know what? I'm rooting for Dusty this time. I want Dusty to beat Philadelphia. It is what it is. And hopefully he doesn't get that toothpick stuck in his mouth because he's constantly flipping that toothpick like Pal on Uncle Buck at the bowling alley. If you've seen that movie, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So when John Candy goes to the bowling alley with his niece, right, and it's bowling night and he's getting his tip from the racetrack from uh, his guy, whatever, I can't remember his friend's name, whatever, he's talking to him and then... Pal comes in, the slippery, slimy character at the bowling alley, comes in and tries to hit on, I don't know, the 14, 15-year-old niece, whatever the hell she is, and he gets that toothpick. He's kind of flipping it like Dusty Baker does in his mouth, and he gets it stuck between, I guess, his tongue and the, and the roof of his mouth. It's the funniest damn thing you've seen in that whole movie. But nonetheless, so I'm kind of rooting for Dusty, as long as he doesn't get that toothpick stuck. But also, back to these home runs, six home runs, or seven home runs, tied for six, as B.J. Upton in 2008, and Jason Worth in 2009 also hit seven. Daniel Murphy hit seven uh, back in 2015. And Jose Altuve in 2017. The controversial, sign stealing, cheating Houston Trash Dros back then, of course, stealing signs. We still hit seven home runs. Anyway, I wonder if that was from the, I don't know, stolen signs? Could be. I don't know. But of those 11 players listed above, Carlos Beltran is the only one who did it. 
Yes, he did not reach the World Series. All the others did. And of course, his Astros lost to the Cardinals in a seven-game National League Championship Series. Now, which player is the most home runs in Major League Baseball postseason game? 11 players have hit three homers in Major League Baseball playoffs and only four have done it in the World Series. Of course, George Herman Ruth, but you can call him Babe Ruth, was the first to pull it off way back 96 years ago. 96 years ago. That's been just a minute, right? 1926. And of course, is the only player with two such games in postseason history. That's crazy. Most recently, Chris Taylor did it for the Dodgers last year. And of course, here are the 11 players who have hit three homers in a single Major League postseason game. Of course, Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth, two times. Bob Robertson, 1971. Reginald Martinez Jackson. A lot of people call him Mr. October. I call him Mr. Mattress Ball. 1977. George Brett. Mr. Pintar, 1978. Adam Kennedy, 2002. Adam Kennedy, man, that, that guy was unconscious in that World Series. Anyway, Adrian Beltre and Albert Pujols both did it in 2011. Pablo Sandoval, the big panda, 2012. Jose Altuve, 17. Kike Hernandez for the Dodgers, 2017, in the cheating World Series by the Astros. And Chris Taylor again for the Dodgers in 2021. All right, a little bit more baseball for your soul just because we can. How about this? You know, the White Sox were looking for a manager. And so they wanted the guy, you know, that could rally the troops and bring bring home the, the World Series, blah, blah, blah. Whatever. I'm a White Sox guy. Look, folks, believe me, I'm a White Sox guy. It is what it is. Unfortunately, what do the White Sox do? An abysmal Hire, in my opinion, they hire Kansas City Royals bench coach Pedro Grifol as the new manager. Are you bleeping kidding me? You had big names out there with big experience that players liked as well. Not to say that nobody likes Grifol, but let's face it, this guy never played big league baseball. Nonetheless, as the story goes, CBS Sports says. The Chicago White Sox have found their next manager, 52-year-old Pedro Gafol, who has been on the Kansas City Royals coaching staff since 2013. According to the four-letter network, the White Sox are expected to announce its hiring very, very soon. And of course, USA Today, the blue paper they are, the blue publication they are, what they have to do, they had to bring some kind of a liberal spin to it. Reported, USA Today reported that Grifol is the only minority candidate to be hired for a managerial or general manager position this offseason. Shut up! Really, shut the bleep up already. Shut the... Up. Seriously, USA Today, enough of that. Of course, that's what they have to do. Who gives a damn? If the job should go, whatever job it is, folks, whatever it is, it should go to the most qualified individual... Despite their race, their gender, their color, their creed, whatever. Enough of this BS. Enough of this race-baiting BS. Enough of this liberal BS. Because that's all it is. Agenda, agenda, agenda. Enough with this crap. USA Today, I just fired you, if you know what I mean. (laughs) You're out of here! Anyway. Griffo, this guy's 52. He's a baseball lifer. He's been described as a baseball baseball lifer. Played catcher as a Miami high schooler. And of course, then for the Florida State Seminoles. Who gives a damn? He was drafted by the Twinkies in 1991, back when I was playing. And was kicked off. Well, which kicked off? (laughs) His nine-year minor league career. This guy didn't have a sniff of the bigs. He didn't even play in the bigs. And now he's going to manage a team loaded with big-time talent. That can win now. What the hell did he have over the other guys? How the hell did he get that job over guys like Bruce Bochy, Isaac Guillen, who's won a World Series with the White Sox already, and a bunch of others? What the (laughs) is going on here? And of course, he began managing in the minors shortly after his playing career ended. Minor league playing career, that is. Yes, That began working, he began working for the Seattle Mariners recently in their minor league instructions as a coordinator. Three years later, he was promoted to director of minor league operations, leaving for the Royals in 2013 after eight years. After eight years, being stuck there, really? Purgatory? 
So this hire marks a sharp departure for the White Sox in one specific area. Previous connection to the team for nearly two decades, the White Sox have hired managers with previous connections to the team. Their past four managers, Ozzie Guillen, World Series champion, Robin Ventura, Ricky Renteria, and Tony La Russa, had a two-time world, three-time World Series champion, Hall of Famer, by the way, have either played or coached or managed for the team before being hired. And Griffal, of course, has absolutely zero previous connection to the White Sox and is going to likely be a colossal failure with them, in my opinion, the same way that Brian Harson, we're going to get to you, Brian Harson, and Auburn in the next segment, was a complete disaster for War Eagle and Auburn football. White Sox need fixing. Can this guy do it? I don't think so. I don't think so. Look, the White Sox got rid of Tony La Russa in a very convenient way, in my opinion. They said, look, buddy, go away. Say you have some medical issues. You're a Hall of Famer. We don't want to fire you. We'll bring in Miguel Castro, who did a really good job, by the way. Miguel Castro should have been the guy. But anyway, we're going to go ahead and let you take over so La Russa could ride off in the sunset. But at the end of the day, we've got a bad hire, in my opinion, in Griffal. This guy is going to fall on his face. Back here with some football. Better yet, a little bit of Auburn for your soul for everybody at WAUD. Don't go anywhere. Lots more to come. Back in a few. Attention business owners, you and your customers are listening to this commercial right now. Face it, every business needs customers, even yours. The Sports Circus is a primetime nationally syndicated program that's carried on ABC, NBC, CNBC, and Westwood One News affiliates, plus CBS, Fox, and NBC sports affiliates across North America with coverage from Hawaii to New York. Also, the Sports Circus is available to the 180 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, and the Sports Circus gets about 4 million website visitors per month, which could click through your website and bring sales. The Sports Circus provides great content featuring celebrity guests from sports and entertainment to our audience every weekday, which your company could greatly benefit from by increasing your visibility, foot traffic, eyeballs to your website, and calls from potential customers. Call us right now at 702-799-9935. Again, 702-799-9935. Or email us at info at thesportscircus.com. That's info at thesportscircus.com. Drive your sales today by advertising with the Sports Circus. Nobody wants to get ripped off, broken into, or robbed, but nobody wants to pay a lot of money to have their home protected either. I I surely wouldn't either. Zijn jouw favorieten? Dag en nacht de fan. Jouw favoriet. Zwoele zomerhits. Klopvaste actua. De leukste cadeaus. Donna. The sound of summer. Radio Donna. AXW Trenton. Kicks 101 and a half. The music you love to hear. WRFM. Stereo 105. You're listening to 97 WYNY. WYNY. C100. Hey, buddy, this is Barry Katz from the Industry Standard Podcast, and you're listening to the Sports Circus with Sal Tuzzolino. <laughs> Oh, 
Welcome back to the Sports Circus. I'm your ringmaster, Sal, live from Las Vegas in the AMP TV studio, AAMP.TV. This segment brought to you in part by our friends over at the American Business Trust Company, helping companies with strategy, sales and marketing, capital resources, and establishing companies with physical locations or on the internet. You decide. For more information, contact the American Business Trust Company at 657 600-1876. That's 657-600-1876. Again, 657-600-1876. Or check them out online at abtrustco.com. That's www.abtrustco.com. Also, email them for more information at info at abtrustco.com. Yes! All right, welcome back to everybody watching on Instagram, on Facebook, and AMP TV, AAMP TV. Make sure you like, subscribe, and follow as well. Also, welcome back to everybody else on TV and radio and streaming and wherever the hell you're at. Guess what? We're over here too, right here in Las Vegas, as you can see by this wonderful sign, everybody watching on TV. What a cool small scale sign of the Las Vegas, welcome to Las Vegas sign. That's great stuff. I like that. All right, talking about great stuff. How about our friends over in Auburn, Alabama? You know, we talked to Danny over at the Mason Jar, good friend of the Sports Circus. And if you are if you happen to be rumbling around in that area, listening on WAUD, head on over and ask Danny, who owns the place, ask Danny where the heck is the Sports Circus milkshake. Huh? <laughs> I've been asking him for quite some time. They've been talking about putting together a very special sports circus milkshake. Of course, it'll be purple. It'll have circus peanuts, likely cotton candy, hopefully. And I don't know, some crazy hodgepodge mix. They make the best damn milkshakes I've ever seen. And the biggest milkshakes I've ever seen. Way bigger than my head, which <laughs> needless to say is really large. But their shakes, I mean, they are huge. So, I mean, they're really fit for a family of four. So you'll see like, you know, big Big uh, cupcakes and stuff on them, bomb pop ice cream, uh, whatever, all popsicles, all kinds of crazy stuff on them. Great stuff. Check out the Mason Jar on University in Auburn, Alabama. Great Southern food. You know, I asked him what makes things so special about the Mason Jar. I said, what about the food, man? The food's phenomenal. He said, look, man, I just make food that everybody else can make, but I make it here. They don't want to make it at home. Uh Gotta like that. So check out the Mason Jar if you're in Auburn or if you're in anywhere in the WAUD or WDJY Atlanta area. And just head on down to Auburn and check that food out. Boy, it, it is a great trip. A lot of the players, of course, from the sports teams right there in town, they like to play there. The coaches like to go there. The food is really, really, really good. All right, Danny, there's your plug. And it's a legit plug. I like it. I don't get paid anything for saying that. I just dig the food, and I love the people there. All right, so just sticking right down there in Auburn, how about something for the War Eagle Nation? Well, you don't talk about frustration. I got to tell you, ever since getting rid of Gus Melzon, and Gus, the former coach, I don't know, for about seven years, whatever, Gus did a pretty good job. And I think the Auburn faithful, they probably miss him a little bit because at least with Gus Melzon, the Tigers are winning. They were winning football games, not in a very sexy way, but they were winning quite a few games. They're in bowl games every year. And right now, the only bowl that they're in, they're in the toilet bowl. That's what's going on. And that is largely due to Brian Harson, the worst hire in all of America, in my opinion, last year, whatever, year and a half ago. This guy could bleep up a cup of coffee <laughs> if you know what i mean right so so i can't say that word because we have to keep this a g-rated show but i gotta thank god for the eagle war eagle nation that brian harson was fired but who does auburn hire next so cbs sports says brian harson is quote incredibly disappointed close quote shut up you have no reason to be disappointed jack you are recruited out of the Mountain West. You were were hired out of the Mountain West out of Boise State where you didn't do anything significant there. You basically maintained a team. You didn't grow the team. And let's face it, you didn't set the world afire there either. You just maintained what the former coach, 
if I'm not mistaken, Gus Malzahn had built previously anyway. The point is, Brian Harson says, oh, I'm incredibly disappointed. Boo-hoo-hoo, shut up, over his dismissal from Auburn. And the former Tigers coach wrote in a lengthy statement one day after he was fired, less than two seasons into his tenure, and millions of dollars into it as well. Harson reflected on his short-lived coaching stint that ended with an abysmal 9-12 and record overall, 4-9 and in the SEC. <laughs> Got to tell you, folks, that's not what the Arbor Nation is used to. Oh, no. And Harson says, quote, I poured my heart and soul into this program and team, and we stood together in the face of considerable challenges and outside noise. Through my entire time at Auburn, we did things the right way, which is not always the easy way. I'm very proud of the resolve shown by everyone in our facility and incredibly grateful for those at Auburn who stood by me and my family. Close quote. Shut up, dude. Are you still in town? Seriously, just leave and stop talking. The faster you stop talking to the people in Auburn, Alabama, and basically the SEC, the better off you'll be. Maybe you'll go find a job in the Pac-12 somewhere where the talent is a hell of a lot less. So the athletic director who hired Harson, Alan Green, conveniently left his post before this season started, leaving Harson with few allies within the Auburn administration after a rocky first season last season. Really? Maybe that's why Allen left in the first place. I don't know, but he probably knew he was going to get canned anyway. And of course, though he never seemed to have the full backing of the university's power brokers, hmm, why is that? Because he was the wrong hire for Auburn in the first place. That's probably what it is. Maybe it's because he's not SEC caliber as far as the coaching world goes. Sorry, kid. Go back to the Mountain West where you belong. Harson will leave with a nice parting gift in the form of $15.3 million in the form of a buyout. Go me the money! That's it, buddy. Go ahead and get your money. Get the hell out of town. Free money at the expense of Auburn University. What a disaster. And this one just keeps coming back. It's like having a greasy pork chop first thing in the morning. It just keeps coming up on you all day long. And Harson is only 46 and will likely dupe another team, another big university, into taking him on and paying him loads of money for what? Mediocrity at best. Sad, isn't it? How about that recruiting? This guy couldn't recruit his way out of a wet paper bag. You think a Mountain West coach is going to compete with Nick Saban and Kirby Smart? I don't think so. Jimbo Fisher? I don't think so. Kiffin? I don't think so. This guy is literally in grade school compared to the college side that these guys are on. And so, I mean, literally, it's a grape and a watermelon. So the grape needs to go back to the Mountain West. And Harson says, quote, like any coach, with the benefit of hindsight, there are things that could have been done differently. That I don't pretend to be perfect, but I am certain I will be better moving forward. It could be worse. Because of this experience, I truly believe Auburn has the potential to be a championship program once again. And the resources, financial support, and fan base are in place. And there are good people throughout this program and university. With complete alignment, the possibilities are endless. Close quote. Shut up! Really? Yes, this is for you again. Because look, Brian Harson, seriously, your quotes? How the hell are you going to say, well... They have the potential to be a championship program. Buddy, they've already been one. Where have you been one? It hasn't happened. I don't think so. So Harson made no revelations about what could be next in his coaching career. But he did amass a 69-16 record in seventh season in the haphazard Mountain West Conference at Boise State, a program that was already built for everybody else that would come in after the prior coach. Big deal. He still lost 19 games in a program that was built to be a wrecking machine. That's right, he still lost one out of five, and they were winning, what, 9, 10 plus games every season anyway. So look, this guy, and they say, of course, and he was receiving some buzz from jobs west of the Mississippi River as things disintegrated for him in Auburn. Good! 
Let him go back to that side of the river and dupe one of those universities. He's not SEC caliber, period. And of course, Harson was mentioned as a candidate for the Colorado, ooh, the Colorado job and the Arizona State job. Let's see if we could pick up all the garbage that was left from behind from all the recruiting violations and all the crap that had happened at Arizona State, right? Another mediocre at best university. And Colorado, their football program's in the toilet. They're almost as bad as Colorado State. Nonetheless, those programs maybe would take a look at them because why? Well, hell, a German Shepherd can go in there and probably do just as good a job. <laughs> anyway, and of course, those two schools have, well, apparently showed some interest. Of course, uh, CBS Sports had reported on this earlier the season. Certainly not now, in my opinion. What a joke. Well, then again, that's the Pac-12 where football was football about 40 years ago. <laughs> Yeah, what are they now? Now they're like a broken Coke machine. Guess what? Harson, go elsewhere. In my opinion, you're awful. And stay awful away from, well, the east side of the Mississippi River. Back here in a few minutes on the circus. Don't go anywhere. Last more to come. Hello Americans, it's Uncle Sam here. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes to the IRS or state, don't worry. I've got important news that may help you negotiate a lower tax bill. In today's economy, the IRS has released a variety of new rules and is offering more flexible terms to help Americans looking to settle their IRS debt. If you apply today, we may be able to lift your wage garnishments and release a freeze on your bank assets or business. Our team of tax professionals can resolve your case and stop collection actions against you. Even if you've been audited or haven't filed a return in years, they can help. Call right now and find out if you qualify to settle your IRS debt for far less than what you owe. Pick up your phone right now and call us for a free $500 IRS tax review. Don't wait. Here's the number. Don't wait. Call right now. 888-794-1630. 888-794-1630. Write it down. 888-794-1630. Again, for the last time, 888-794-1630. Are you a small business owner or pursuing the dream of starting your own company? Do you know where to start or how to grow that existing business? The American Business Trust Company has the answers you need. The American Business Trust Company can help you start up with capital, business strategy, sales, and marketing, and establish your company with a physical location or an online presence on the internet. You decide, you bring the idea, then American Business Trust can help with the rest. For a free evaluation, visit them online at abtrustco.com. That's abtrustco.com. Or call them at 657-600-1876. That's American Business Trust Company. 657-600-1876. Call them today. They'll help your business right away. That's American Business Trust Company. Online at abtrustco.com. American Business Trust Company. That's the sound of sizzling, dry-aged, USDA prime Wagyu and Angus steaks from UppercutChops.com. They're best-in-class filet mignons, New York steaks, and the king of all steaks, the tomahawk and cowboy cut ribeyes are the best in the business. Even their prime Wagyu burgers will likely be the best you've ever had. Browse the full selection of steaks and chops at UppercutChops.com from the comfort of your home or on your mobile device. UppercutChops.com delivers all-natural, dry-aged, USDA prime Wagyu and Angus steaks and chops directly to your door. Without the hassle of going to the grocery store and fight crowds to pick from a small selection of average at best meats with injected steroids, fillers, and coloring added to look good. Find out what's for dinner at UppercutChops.com or call 702-799-9935 at 702-799-9935, 702-799-9935, or make your selection directly at UppercutChops.com. Hey, this is Tommy John, and you're listening to the Sports Circus. (laughs) 
Welcome back to the Sports Circus. I'm your ringmaster, Sal, live from Las Vegas in the AMP TV studio, AAMP.TV. Make sure you like, subscribe, and follow. Of course, this segment is brought to you in part by the Sports Circus. And of course, all of its partners, they can be found at thesportscircus.com under partners. One of those is the College of Southern Nevada Athletics, csncoyotes.com, for upcoming events and game schedule and tickets. That's csncoyotes.com. Check them out, folks. csncoyotes.com for the College of Southern Nevada Athletics. Yes! All right, a big welcome back to everybody watching on TV, on our CBS, NBC, and Fox Sports affiliates. On radio as well, Cox, Comcast, Spectrum, Frontier, Wild Cable Television, Hotel Television, and a half a million rooms from coast to coast. Also, everybody streaming, Instagram, Facebook, and AMP TV, as mentioned before, as well as, well, hell, I don't know, where else are you watching or listening? All those independents as well from coast to coast, we got to include them too. All right, so it was, well, the canny of Brian Harson, thank God, over in Auburn, Alabama. And we're going to stick with college football, talk a little bit about these bowl projections. They're starting to come out already. Yes, they're already coming out. And let's face it, a lot of these teams, they kind of know their destiny already. And so the bowl committees for each one of these bowl games have already had, well, some kind of idea of who they think that they'd like to invite. I'd like to see one for like the worst two teams in football, too. you got to have one of those. Anyway, starting off way early in December. Well, I wouldn't say early in December. Early in the bowl season on December 16th, we have the Bahamas Bowl projected teams. Our University of Texas El Paso, UTEP, the Miners, and Ball State. Yes, Ball State in a bowl game. The Cure Bowl. Liberty. The Liberty Flames against App State, Appalachian State, got to tell you, that is a fun team to watch. That would be one hell of a game to watch. The Fenway Bowl at Fenway Park would feature, if everything ended today, Syracuse and Cincinnati. A very interesting matchup as well. So they try to get these, I wouldn't say oddball matchups, but intriguing matchups. Somebody I know used to say intriguing all the time, so we'll go ahead and throw that out there. The New Mexico Bowl. This is one of those games that nobody really cares to either go to or watch on television. Usually a very small population of people go. Anyway, would feature as it started if it was to be selected today on December 17th. Errors, or no, it would be Air Force. The Air Force Academy against North Texas, the mean green of North Texas. That team is for real. They, those guys are no joke. The L.A. Bowl. Huh, the L.A. Bowl, right? Boise State, the aforementioned Boise State. And Washington, a very strange matchup, but yet in proximity, they're not too terribly far apart. The Lending Tree Bowl, same date, December 17th, would feature Miami of Ohio and South Alabama. The Las Vegas Bowl, now that, you know, it's funny, the Las Vegas Bowl used to be really bad. It was almost like the Toilet Bowl. It featured, I think, the second place, what's it, maybe the second place Mountain West team or something like that. First place Mountain West team, which nobody really gives a damn about in the first place. And, of course... It was the fifth place team from the Pac-12. But now this year, it actually is the next matchup below the Rose Bowl. So that would feature right now Utah and an at-large team. And they have LSU pitted for that one. Imagine Utah defense and LSU, what? Defense. That game could end up 3-2. to two. You never know. The Frisco Bowl out of Frisco, Texas. Not San Francisco, by the way. Frisco Bowl would feature Middle Tennessee State and SMU. Of course, SMU being the home team. And the Ponies would have a decided advantage in that one. The Myrtle Beach Bowl, played two days later, would feature University of Texas San Antonio, the Roadrunners, a very good team, against the Coastal Carolina Chanticleers, a very good team. Now, that would be one hell of a game to go to. I'd like to go to that one. Myrtle Beach is kind of a cool place to go anyway. The Potato Bowl. Yes, they have a Potato Bowl. And guess what? Featured in that one, if it was to be selected today to be played on December 20, would be San Diego State, the Aztecs, against the Bobcats of Ohio. A very oddball mix, but a decided advantage to San Diego State there even in, of course, everybody making the recruit up to Idaho. And, of course, the Boca Raton Bowl. That would be the Boca Raton Bowl, if you know what I mean. That would feature Florida Atlantic and Brigham Young. 
And that one screams Brigham Young all day, every day. New Orleans Bowl, December 21st, at this point would feature a very good Western Kentucky club. I believe those are the Hilltoppers against the Golden Eagles of Southern Mississippi. That would be Brett Favre School. The Armed Forces Bowl, if it was selected today, according to this selection committee, whatever the hell, Armed Forces Bowl would feature Memphis, University of Memphis, and Texas Tech. Boy, that Texas Tech team, I'm not saying this because our content is carried on Raider Radio. I'm saying these guys, man, they could score in bunches, and they could beat big teams, and they have knocked off big teams. So Memphis and Texas Tech would pose a very interesting matchup, but that one would go advantage Texas Tech all day, every day. You're going to have to outscore this club, and this club is scoring well into the 30s and 40s every game, it seems. The Gasparilla Bowl on the 23rd of December would feature Bucky the Badger from Wisconsin. It's a very tired program. Just kind of sick of seeing Wisconsin. And Georgia Southern. Kind of rooting for Georgia Southern if they're playing Wisconsin because Like Wisconsin's Wisconsin. Yeah, you go there for your your stuff that you like to get there, the cheese products, the the beer, of course, whatever. But it is a tired program. You get tired of seeing these guys because they don't play an exciting brand of football. It's a rather boring game. So, frankly, I wouldn't even want to watch that one on TV. The Independence Bowl. Independence Bowl, of course, would feature Wyoming, the Cowboys of Wyoming, and the Cadets of Army. Wow, a highly efficient running game at Army against a run-and-shoot wild passing game for Wyoming. Who would win that one? Wow. The Hawaii Bowl would feature, that's on the 24th of December, San Jose State at University of Alabama, Birmingham, the Blazers. A very, very good matchup there, very underrated matchup. That's one that the odds makers will likely stay away from in Vegas. The Quick Lane Bowl played in played in Detroit. I got something for you here, folks. For all you Detroit people, Detroit sucks! <laughs> Detroit sucks! And who the heck's going to want to go to Detroit to watch a bowl game? I have no idea. But it would be the criminals, the thug criminal players, potentially, as in my opinion, from Michigan State against the Rockets of Toledo. Go Rockets, go! The first responder bowl on December 27th would feature, if it was selected today, the University of Houston Cougars and, of course, the Washington State Cougars, right? So either way, you're going to get cooged, if you know what I mean. Sort of an inside joke with our friends at Washington State. The Birmingham Bowl played on December 27th, if it was selected today, would feature South Carolina and Louisiana. How do you like that? And the Camellia Bowl played on the same day would feature the Bulls of Buffalo. And the men of Troy. Boy, what a great matchup that would be. The guaranteed rate bowl. Iowa and Baylor. That would be Baylor and Baylor by a big margin. Iowa doesn't even belong on the field in any bowl game in the first place, in my opinion. And they're going to get spanked by Purdue. You could bank on that one. Time stamp this one. Purdue is going to give them a good old-fashioned ass whooping. Military Bowl, December 28th. Miami, the Miami Thugs. But you can call them University of Miami Hurricanes. And Central Florida. That's Gus Melzon's team. How about Gus Melzon playing against in-state rival Miami? How do you like that? Now, UCF is going to the Big 12 next season. So this would be essentially a Big 12 and ACC matchup. Pretty good game right there. Going to root for those University of Central Florida Knights who should have won the national title a few years back. The Liberty Bowl, usually a good game, would feature somehow Kansas who got off to a hot start 5-0, only to fall in the next three games, would play a very good Arkansas team. And I mean a good Arkansas team. Arkansas literally would obliterate Kansas in any bowl game. Doesn't matter where they're played. The Holiday Bowl has been a great game every year. Well, except for this year, they have a selection of the University of Pittsburgh and UCLA. Yes, Pittsburgh and UCLA. (laughs) UCLA doesn't even draw at home. How many people are going to draw from San Diego in the first place? The Texas Bowl would feature, of course, Texas and Texas A&M. That's an old matchup from the old Southwest Conference. The Pinstripe Bowl played where? Yankee Stadium. Notre Dame against Minnesota. 
The Cheez-It Bowl. Yes, there is such a thing. The Cheez-It Bowl. North Carolina and Oklahoma. North Carolina would probably win by, I don't know, a solid 30-odd points. Oklahoma is a really bad team this year. They would only make a bowl game because of their paperclip logo, in my opinion, in the first place. (laughs) Now, the Alamo Bowl, played in San Antonio, would feature a very good Kansas State team against a very good Oregon team. And by the way, that Oregon team, yes, features the Auburn quarterback from last year, Bo Nix, who's playing out of his mind this year. Why? Because Bo is in a good system. Had Bo been in a better system in Auburn, Bo would still be at Auburn, if you know what I mean. K-State and Oregon, what a hell of a game. That'll be one of the better bowl games of the season if that one actually plays out. How about the Duke's Mayo Bowl? I don't know if that's mayonnaise or I don't don't even know. Nonetheless, the Duke's Mayo Bowl, December 30, would feature a very good NC State team and Maryland. What a weird matchup. Why would that matchup even occur? Maryland's not bowl worthy. They're not that good. The Sun Bowl would feature Oregon State, the Beavers, against the Louisville Cardinals. How do you like that one? Oregon State would run rough shot over Louisville. The Gator Bowl would feature the Duke Blue Devils and a very strong defensive-minded Mississippi State Club. Boy, that would be one hell of a game. The Arizona Bowl would feature <coughs> our local university here, which I don't even want to mention the name, against Eastern Michigan. The Arizona Bowl would probably draw a crowd of 500. Now, the Music City Bowl, as they saw last year, a wild game with Purdue and Tennessee. Purdue winning in the last moments, beating the number one team right now in the CFP, Tennessee. Purdue would match up against the Florida Gators on New Year's Eve. Oh, yeah, one hell of a game. The Reliquist Bowl, January 2nd, Florida State and Kentucky. The Citrus Bowl would feature Illinois and Old Miss. Boy, that would be offensive defense. Good matchup there. The Orange Bowl would feature Wake Forest and Tennessee. Tennessee would destroy them. And, of course, the Sugar Bowl, TCU and Alabama. The Peach Bowl would feature Georgia and Michigan. The Fiesta Bowl would feature Ohio State and Clemson. The Cotton Bowl, Oak State and Tulane. And the Rose Bowl would be Penn State and the University of Southern California Trojans. Who's going to win the national title? Look, folks. Those top spots, the top four, are very interchangeable as they stand today. Nobody knows. The last New Year's Six games and the BCS games or CFP games, I should say, the college football playoff games, it's in complete flux right now. That whole top eight is going to likely change and turn over. So who the hell knows what's going to happen there? But those are your bolt projections as of today. So circle this one on the calendar, and who knows what the hell's going to happen in the next week, two, or three. All right, folks, that's going to do it for the Sports Circus. I'm your ringmaster, Sal. We'll see you next time right here on your favorite station. Until then, so long, everyone. If you're living with diabetes and using insulin, you know the pain of pricking your fingers over and over again. Ouch! Well, by wearing a small remote device called a Continuous Glucose Monitor, or CGM, you can reduce the pain of pricking your fingers. If you administer insulin three or more times per day or use an insulin pump, call now and learn how a CGM can help you. Painless. No more pricking my finger. No finger pricks. Convenience. They delivered it free and they took care of all the paperwork. You can reduce pain right away. Plus, it's accurate, easy to use, and helps you spend more time in range. And if you have insurance, you can get a new CGM at little or no out-of-pocket cost. Call now and get free shipping of your new CGM. Plus, we'll bill your insurance for you. 800-659-7805. 800-659-7805. 800-659-7805. That's 800-659-7805.